Okay, good evening, uh, brothers and sisters. Time for us to begin our Q&A uh, for tonight. Thank you all for being a part of these studies. Uh, again, there's no master teacher. I always like to let you all know that, you know, we're all here on, to learn and to see what does say the Lord. And uh, whatever questions are asked, we want God's answer. Uh, rightly divided from his word. And so thank you all for being a part of these studies. If you're visiting for the first time on here, thank you uh, for being here. And again, if you have any questions you'd like to ask, uh, if you have any spiritual concerns, just let us know and just hold us accountable to give you book, chapter, and verse, whatever questions uh, that you have concerning what you are here on tonight. Uh, these are being recorded, as you all know, mute your mics if they're not muted so that we don't get any feedback. And I think all of you know, unless you're visiting, that you can use these recordings by uh, seeing Brother Coffee. And uh, thank you, Brother Coffee, for the phenomenal job you and Brother Javier are doing in getting these messages out, my brother. All right. Before we get started, let's open up in a word of prayer. Brother Coffee, I want to impose on you, brother, just to open it up for us uh, tonight, if you don't mind. Let us pray. Most gracious Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for this day that you have made that we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you've allowed him to come into this world and to be the example that we need to, um, to witness in the scriptures, Father. We just pray, Father, that we continue to be faithful unto death. We thank you, Father, for the brethren that are here tonight that are to hear another portion of your word. We pray, Father, that you, you have equipped your manservant to teach us tonight, tonight Father, according, uh, according to the scriptures, Father, rightly divided. We thank you, Father, for a safe trip that he and his wife has returned home safe. We just pray that they enjoy themselves. And now that they're back home safely, Father, we just give you thanks and praise. We continue to pray for those, Father, that are sick among us, that you will be with them and heal their bodies according to your will. We ask, Father, that you forgive us, Lord, of our sins and cleanse us, Father, from all unrighteousness. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I want to turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is where the first question is going to come from on tonight. And the question I want to deal with tonight is, what does Paul mean when he says he became all things to all men uh, that he might win some? So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's look at that because there's a lot of misconceptions about what Paul uh, means when he writes what he writes here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And while you turn there, I just want to remind you that in chapter 9, Paul is writing to the saints in Corinth, really talking about his rights as a Christian. You know, as Christians, we have liberties, we have rights. Even as an apostle, he has liberties and he has rights. Uh, but he doesn't always take advantage of those rights if it would hinder uh, the, the propagation of the gospel message. So, and so in his writing to these saints, I'm going to start with verse number 19, 1 Corinthians 9, 19. Paul says, for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law to them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law of Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof, he says, with you. And so what does Paul mean when he says what he says in verse number Verse number 22, so the weak I became weak, and, and that I might gain the weak, and I made all things uh, to all men that I might by all means, he says, save some. And so what I want us to understand is Paul is teaching that what was common for him to do was to become what he needed to become uh, to the people that he's talking to that he might be able to reach them to get them to understand what they needed to do in order to be saved. And so Paul, when he spoke to Jews, I want you to get this, when he was preaching or teaching the gospel message to Jews, he knew the people, the audience that he was talking to. And so when he was talking to a Jew, Paul would understand that the Jews understood the law and they understood the prophecies that are written in the Bible. So when you go back to Romans chapter three, and just want to illustrate this, what Paul is saying in Romans chapter three. So if Paul was came in contact with Jews and he did, he, he preached to the Jews as well as to the Gentiles. But when he's talking to a Jew, Paul understood that the Jews had an advantage in that they had the law, the written law of God, and they also had the prophets. So in Romans three, one and two, Paul says, what advantage then have the Jew? And so we have to understand the Jews had an advantage because again, they were 
God's chosen people and they had God's written law. He says, or what profit is there of circumcision? He said, much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So you see what Paul is saying there in Romans 3, 1 and 2? Paul is saying in, in Romans 3, 1 and 2, that the Jews had an advantage uh, because they had the prophecies and they had the written law of God. And so they were already, they were already disposed to what it meant to, to be pleasing to God based upon the written scriptures. That's what the Jews should have known. They should have known the law. They knew the prophets, uh, the prophecies, and they knew the Bible, the old covenant. And so when uh, uh, Paul or Jewish people would come in contact with with Jews, they would start by trying to share the gospel message with them by beginning with the oracles of God, with the written word of God. Give me an example of that. Go to Acts chapter 8. Go to Acts chapter 8. Here's what Philip did in Acts chapter 8. And brother, so this is something you and I need to learn. Really, he's using wisdom. You got to know the audience uh, that you're you're sharing the gospel message with, and you got to take the audience from, from where they are. So go to Acts chapter 8 with me. Acts chapter 8 with me. Acts chapter 8. Uh, I'm going to get you to mute your mic. Somebody needs to mute their mic. I'm on my phone, so I can't see everybody right now. But make sure your mic is uh, muted because we're getting a lot of feedback from somebody on here. Uh, so go to Acts chapter 8 with me. And I want you to look with me in verse number 30. And remember, this is Philip who is going to go to an Ethiopian eunuch, an individual who is just coming back from worship service. And he has a Bible. And so in Acts chapter 8 and verse 30, and Philip ran there to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understand thou what you read is? He said, how can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led of the sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb done before his shears, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray you of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man. Now look what Philip does. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doesn't hinder me to be baptized? Now, I wanted to read those scriptures just to show you that Philip knew the audience he was talking to. He became what this man needed him to become so that he might win him. And so he started with his understanding of where this eunuch was as it relates to his relationship with God. This eunuch has the scriptures. And so what Philip did is he used the scriptures to present the message that he needed to hear in order to be saved. Now, mind you, when you read the book of Isaiah, there is nothing in the book of Isaiah that says anything about water baptism. I want you to remember that. Nothing in Isaiah. And this guy is reading from the same Isaiah we have in our Bible, Isaiah chapter 53. He's reading from Isaiah 53. When you and I read Isaiah 53 in our Bibles right now, verse 7 and 8, you will see nothing about water baptism. But what did Philip do? He took him from where he was and shared the gospel message with him so that he could be saved. So Philip became all things to all men, this particular man, that he might win him. He took him from exactly where he was. When you go to, back to Acts chapter 2, it's no different than what Peter does on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, we got all these Jews that are there on a feast day, uh, the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. And what Peter is going to do, he's going to take these Jews and these proselytes and all these people that are there who have a knowledge of God because they're in Jerusalem. They have some knowledge about who God is. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And so what Peter is going to do, he's going to take these people who are there from where they are for the purpose of trying to save them. Look in Acts chapter 2 and just read some of his sermon beginning at verse number 17 with me. In Acts 2, 17, it, the, the Bible said, and it shall come to pass. And this is Peter's sermon here. He says, and it shall come to pass in the last day, said God. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servant and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs and earth beneath Acts 2 19 blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned in the darkness and the moon and the blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Lord shall be saved. You men of Israel, this is what Peter says, verse 22, these words, Jesus of Nazareth, 
a man, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken, and by wicked hands you have crucified and slain, whom God had raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. For David speaking concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he's on my right hand that I should not be moved. Now, notice what Peter is doing. He's using the scripture. I want you to be mindful when he talks about the son being turned to blood and, and pouring out the spirit in Acts 2.18 uh, on the handmaids, he, he understands the audience that he's talking to. He's taking them back to the Old Testament scriptures. And so he's using the Old Testament scriptures to be able to preach the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so he's showing that what you are seeing, what you are witnessing here on the day of Pentecost is a fulfillment of what God had said through the prophets under the law of God, okay, under the Old Testament. And so when Paul says, I became all things all men that I might win some, in other words, what he's saying is when he came in contact with folk, he was taking them from where they are. Go to Acts 17. Just give me a minute. Acts 17. So did Paul just talk, speak to the to the, to the Jews? No, he also spoke to Gentiles. Paul also spoke to people who did not have the Old Testament scriptures. And when you turn to Acts 17, here's one of those occasions. In Acts 17, remember, Paul is going to Athens. Uh, he's going to a Gentile, a pagan uh, city, for that matter, who had a multiplicity of gods. And what Paul is not, and God, I want you to notice this, when Paul talks to them, he's not going to start preaching to them, teaching them based upon the scriptures. He's not going to use scriptures. These are Gentiles. These are Athenians. These are not people who have God's word. And so Paul has to understand the audience that he's talking to, and he's going to have to take them from where they are. Start with me in verse 22, Acts 17, 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, you men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. Now that word too superstitious there means they are too religious. And he's going to tell us why they are too religious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship him, declare unto you. Y'all see what Paul, you see the wisdom in Paul? Paul takes them from where they are. They have a, a, a zeal for God. They're searching for God, but they don't know who the true and the living God is. So he's going to take their belief in a God and then he's going to describe to them about the unknown God. And he's going to preach to them the truth. Notice this, verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Let me stop right there. When he uses that word God in verse 24, he is talking about the Father. Please understand that. Paul is going to talk about the one, the only true God. He's going to be talking about Jesus as God in verse 24. And it's going to be very evident as we read through this. He is going to be talking about Jehovah. He's going to be talking about the Father. Let me stop right here. Let me, let me say this about the Father. Brothers and sisters and, and those on, on here, I want you to listen to me. The Jews, and this is a sidebar, just thinking while, while we're talking. The Jews under the old covenant never called God the Father. Please understand that. You will not find in the Old Testament where the Jews called God their Father. That does not happen until Jesus comes on the scene. He teaches his disciples how to pray. He says, our Father which is in heaven. They never called God their Father. Please understand that. You won't find that under the old covenant. And so the father-son's relationship did not transpire, was not even known until Jesus brought it to our attention. So we have to, when we study today, when we see the word God in the Bible, we have to understand what God is the writer talking about in his context. So when we look at Acts 17, 24, God that made the world and all things therein, he's talking about the Father, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelling not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he give it to all life and breath and all things, and had made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and had determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation, 
that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our very being, our, own, our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. Now listen to this. Look at verse 31. This is how we know we're talking about the Father. Because he, talking about the Father, had appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Now he's talking about his son in righteousness by that man, talking about Jesus, whom he had ordained, whereof he had given assurance unto all men in that he had raised him. From, <laughs> that he had raised him from the dead. Y'all see that? So verse 31 is crucial that we understand. Paul is taking these Athenians from where they are, but he's not going to preach a different message. The message will always be the same, but the way he's going to present the message is going to be presented from understanding where they at as it relates to even knowing who God is. And so this is what Paul means when he says, I became all things to all men that I might win some. He takes people from where they are. And he shares the truth of the message. The message, the end of the message is always the same, that there is one father, and this father sent his son to die for the sins of the world. There is a father who has a son, and all must obey him. And the evidence to these people, these Athenians who don't have the New Testament, uh, the Old Testament, the message to them is God, the father had a son, and he and his raising him from the dead is the proof, is the proof factor that he in fact is that he is the son that he is the son of god okay that he is the son of god so now go to acts chapter 16 1 and 3 acts 16, acts 16. now th this isn't just for this wasn't just becoming all things all men that we might win some just to the non-christian paul had this attitude as well when he was talking to his own brethren you know, there are times we to our own brethren, we have to become all things to all men that we might win some. Remember in Acts 16 when when Paul was dealing with, with Timothy uh, in Acts chapter 16, verse number one, then came he to Derby and Lystra and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews, which were in those quarters, for they knew all, for they knew all that he, his father rather, was a Greek. And so what we have here is we have a, an instance where, well, Paul, because he understand that these Jews will not listen to a Gentile, what he would do in this case he would, he would make Timothy to become all things to all men that he might win some. But again, Paul would only do this because he knew the audience that he was coming to and the people that he would be dealing with. But remember in Galatians chapter 2, and then we'll close with this, Galatians chapter 2, because he knew the audience that he was dealing with, he would not have Titus circumcised. So go to Galatians chapter 2. He wouldn't have Titus circumcised because he knew this audience and what they were teaching and what their belief system was. So when you go to Galatians chapter two, Paul's going to make sure I'm going to become all things, all men that I might win some, but this doesn't mean he's going to become all things, all men to win some that he's going to become a sinner. I want to make this is the point I really want to make. Don't mean that you and I become all things, all men that we might win some that you become a prostitute or a, or a sinner or a thief or a robber. You don't become, you can't become anything that is sinful that you might win somebody. And so in Galatians chapter two and verse number one, listen to this. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel, which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them, which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain, but neither Titus who was with me being a Greek was compelled to be circumcised. And he's going to explain why in verse four. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in 
who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. And so Paul understand there's, there was an audience he was going to be talking to who were demanding that you be circumcised or that you hold on to certain parts of the law that had been done away with so that you can be righteous in the sight of God. So Paul said, in this case, I'm not going to, and Titus refused to be circumcised, okay? Uh, because he knows who he's talking to. So somebody say, well, why would he circumcise? Why would he circumcise Timothy? Well, because those of us who are Christians, we understand at the end of the day, circumcision, whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, doesn't mean anything anyway at the end of the day. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 proves that. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7. It's not that, you know, if a, if a parent chooses to circumcise their child, even today, you know, that's, you know, for it could be for medicinal purposes. You want them to circumcise your male boy? You can do that. But you got to understand, there is no law that you and I are under today that demands that your male boys be circumcised. Please understand, you can't be doing it for religious purposes or to be righteous in the sight of God. And so in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 18, Paul says this, Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandment, of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherewith he was called. Are you called being a servant? Care not for it, but though thou mayest be free, use it rather, he says that. So I just wanted to point out that it doesn't matter uh, whether a person is circumcised or uncircumcised as it relates to a person being righteous uh, in, the sight, in the sight of God, okay? And so becoming all things to all men, we got to say, it's not, Paul's not saying he became a sinner so that he can win sinners. You and I can't become sinners to win sinners. We just got to know the audience that we're talking to, that we're dealing with, and be able to to present the message that everyone needs Jesus in order to be saved and have a relationship with the Father, okay? Anybody have any questions or comments? Any questions or comments? Any questions or comments on that particular question? What, what yeah, Paul I do got a, when he said, yes, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, because I can't see the hands. I'm on this phone. I, got, uh, so go I do have a yes. comment, um, sure. and I'm, I'm glad that you touched on it, because, um, you know, there are a lot of people today in this world that, would use that scripture to try to justify why um, a Christian uh, should do certain things and put themselves in certain situations and places. And uh, I've always used that. Um, you know, I came out of the Baptist world. So nine times out of 10, when I'm talking to people about the faith um, is, and, and we're talking about, you know, the one true church, or we're trying to, I'm trying to talk to them about, you know, believing in baptism. I always put myself in a position to come from where they're at because I need them to understand that I too relate with where they are right now, but here is how I came to the understanding of what I know now. And, um, and I'm, I just, I'm glad that you, um, that you opened up with that, uh, with, with, with that because it, it helped. Um, I, I, I mean, you read the scriptures and, 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 and you see it, but you don't pay attention from that standpoint. And then now I'm able to actually look at it and say, well, no, that is correct. Each time you really see, you know, the who are, whether it's whether it's Paul, whether it's Peter, you know, Philip, you see them coming from where that person is at to get them to where they need to go to. So I, I really appreciate that. God bless you, Brother Kenny. Amen. Anybody else? Because I can't see hands. I'm going to try to get on my computer if I can. Can you please? Yes. Hello. Yes. Go can ahead, Sister Nick. Mm -hmm. Can you please go back on Acts 17 and verse 23 with the when you was talking about that a uh, God there is the Father? Can you please and 24? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, let's go back and read it. It says, For I as I passed by, I beheld your devotions, and I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. And then I read verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. And so the, the point I was making is these are Athenians, uh, Greeks. They, you know, this if you ever study Greek mythology, you know, they Greek, they had Zeus and Epaphrodite, they, you know, they had several gods of the sun, god of the moon. And, and they were, as Paul said, they were too superstitious. 
too religious. When you look up that word too superstitious in the Greek, it is they're too religious. You know, and so they don't know who the true and the living God is. These are Gentiles. That's the point I'm making. And so what Paul does is Paul takes them from where they are because they have an inscription on whatever piece of wood or whatever altar they made inscribed on there was to the unknown God. And so Paul used that inscription he saw written somewhere on something that the Athenians had. He said, that's what I'm going to use. I'm going to talk about this unknown God to them who they ignorantly worship. And so he took them from where they are and he started talking about the father who has a son who came to this earth. And, and, and the proof that he is the father is that he raised his son up. Cause look, look, cause remember he's going to preach the death, burial and the resurrection is what Paul is going to preach. Let me find, if I find the scripture, look in verse uh, number. Should seek the Lord happily. Give me one second. Look in verse number 20, uh, 20, let's look at 26. And he had made of one blood, talking about what God did, but made of one blood all nations of men for the dwell on the face of the earth and a determined time before appointed and the bounds of the habitation that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move, have our very being, verse 28, as certain of your own poets said, for you are his offspring, uh, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, verse 29, we ought not to think that the Godhead uh, is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man. So, you know, let me just stop right there. When you look at the word Godhead, that implies there's a head in the Godhead. There's a head. Somebody's the head. You know, the head of Christ, we understand in 1 Corinthians 11 and 3, is the Father. So there's a Godhead that Paul is bringing up to people who know nothing about God. But listen to this. In the time of the in verse 20, 30, God winked at, but now commanded every man to repent. And look at verse 31, because he had appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. Now, listen to this. The Father has appointed a day. Now, remember, Jesus don't even know the day or the hour when he's going to come back. So Paul is letting them know the Father has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in, 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 in the, the world by righteousness. But how is the Father going to judge the world? By that man whom he had ordained. See, so remember, it's going to be Jesus that's going to be judging us on the day of judgment. 2 Corinthians 5 10, where we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But see, that's how the Father has chosen to judge the world through his son, Jesus Christ, and our belief in his son as being the promised seed to come into the world. So he says, whereof he had given assurance unto all men. So how did the Father assure us that Jesus is his son? In that, he had raised him from the dead. Y'all see that? The Father raised Jesus from the dead. And so there's going to be a time when the father is going to send him back and through him, through Jesus, will the father be judging the world. Okay. That makes sense. Everybody get that? Did that answer your question, Sister Hernandez? Or did you yes. have, you sure? Yeah. yeah. But can, can you also, to, yeah, thank you very much. And in 24, yes. uh, because it's, it's very disturbing how brethren are teaching about God is the son, the three yeah. in one is terrible. Can you yeah. please, if you don't mind, in, in 24 where it says, God that made the world and all things, he referring to the son, right? Yes. See, because this terminology and, and what Paul, and that's why we have to keep the context. Remember, the father made everything. That's There's just no getting around that. The father okay. made everything. Now, again, that would include his son. Now, again, okay. he uses the son. Remember, Jesus doesn't do any work, brothers and sisters, unless his father tells him to. The words he spoke, he spoke of his father. You know, the, the miracles he did, he did of his father. And so the father created Jesus. And through Jesus, what the father did was created the world. Okay, you see that? He has created the world. So somebody say, well, did, I thought Jesus created everything. He did. But Jesus didn't create because he just decided of his own to create. He created because his father allowed him to create. He, he, does that make sense? Jesus didn't just say, yeah, I'm just going to create. I don't care what my father say. I'm going to create the world. No, the father 
used Jesus. He worked through Jesus. He worked with Jesus to create the world and everything in it. But Jesus did not create his father. His father is greater than he is. And we have to understand that Jesus didn't create his own self. His father created, he's the son of God. That's why it's very important language that we see son and father, son and father relationship. And so God, at the end of the day, made everything. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. This is, it's a, go to 1 Corinthians 15. And I, I don't know if any hands up, but I, they go to 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. See, Jesus, brothers and sisters, is in charge of everything. He has all power, all authority. And the Bible says, get this, in heaven and in earth. That's what the scripture teaches. Jesus has all power, all authority in heaven and earth, but he does not have power over his father. He doesn't have power over his father. Look in verse number 22. Paul says, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruit, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end. Now Paul is dealing with What's going to happen whenever the father sends the son back? Remember, Jesus don't know the day or the hour when he's going to come back. Not even the angels in heaven know, but he says, but my father only. So whenever the father sends him back, verse 24, then it's going to come the end when he, talking about Jesus, shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. Now, somebody say, well, isn't Jesus God? Yes, but he's the son of God. He's not going to deliver the kingdom up to himself. And, and Paul's going to say that. He's going to deliver up the kingdom to God. God who? Even the Father. When he shall, when Jesus is going to put down all rule, all authority, and all power. Who gave it to him? His Father did. He says, for he must reign, Jesus must reign, till he had put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Are people still dying today? Yes. So guess who's still ruling? Jesus is. As long as people are still dying, brothers and sisters, we live in a world people are dying. You, you and I know that the last enemy has not been destroyed. Jesus still has all power and authority. Now look what he says. For he, now look at verse 24, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he had put all things under his feet. Who are we talking about now? The Father. The Father had put all things under Jesus' feet. Now, look at this. But when he said all things are put under him, it is manifest or it's understood that he, that the Father, is accepted, which did put all things under him. You see that? So Jesus in charge of everything in heaven and earth except his Father. Where is his Father at? His Father's in heaven. He's at the right hand of his Father as we speak. But what the scripture lets us know, he's in charge of everything in heaven or except his father. You see that? It, it should be understood that Jesus is not over his father, that Jesus has a God. Now look what's going to happen. And when all things shall be should do unto him, then shall the son also himself be subject unto him that put all things unto him, that God may be all in all. Talking about the father. Okay. And so we got to understand there's only one true and living God, the father. Jesus has a God, even as we speak. And Jesus has never said he was greater than his father because he understand he was created by his father. Okay. Did I answer your question, Sister yeah. Hernandez? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, my sister. Brother, yeah. uh, brother Coffee, I see at your hand. I'm okay. I got to get off of this. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Um, to um, further your point in Acts 17, um, also in Acts chapter 14 and